we organized this lecture series to accompany our exhibition, I Do Not See Coming, uh, which deals with questions about violence in a temporary dispersive structure in the Lothringer Halle. Mm -hmm. Last week, Dr. Leutinger spoke about the territorial occupation of planet Earth and thus about borders, data, collection, and migratory aspects. And this evening, I'm very happy to have Kito Oliveira, um, and all of you here in person and also on screen. Um, getting the opportunity to gain an insight and later discuss about his recent work, which comes from research on excellent recognition technologies and now focus on the fractalization of voice in the frequency domain, a side of thought, of struggle, and intervention. This is the topic of this talk spectral ambulance, visualizing, machine listening, and physics of situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be in the room with people again, provided like caution, yeah. Um, yeah, nice to see the room back. Um, it's, what I'm gonna do is, is that I'm gonna speak a little bit about more recent work that I've done between the artistic and the, the art and theoretical and play some examples. And also like kind of open up a little bit my literally opening a little bit Oh, yeah, it's true. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> it's good for my voice, not good for my, yeah, the health scale. Anyways, um, yeah, so I work a lot between like the artistic and the theoretical. And what I wanted to do is actually kind of through the works that I've been doing more recently, open up a lot of questions that I'm still trying to figure out through my work that connect with the, the general topic of sound and violence, which is something that I've been kind of working with since uh, 2013, maybe 14, perhaps. Um, and yeah, so there's a lot of questions that, that are still open in my head as well. And I think, it's always nice to bring them to the room and uh, let them let them flow freely a little bit, you know. Uh, so before I start, let me just put a timer because otherwise I babble into infinity, and it's not always good. Um, but so I'll just teeny tiny bit without getting too much into like you know historical whatever. Um, I'm originally from Brazil, but I've been living in Germany uh, since the end of 20, uh, 2000, 2009, end of 2009, so it's gonna be 13 years this year. I did my master's and my PhD here. Um, and especially my PhD, I wrote my thesis about the relationship between sound and police violence in Brazil, especially around 2013 when I started my PhD, the country was going through this wave of public protests, like uh, popular protests, that as a country are still figuring out what they were all about because it was like this weird mishmash of, you know, people demanding basic rights, racial politics as well, but also some weird right wing mishaps in between. So as a country, I mean, we're still living the consequences of stuff that started there with Bolsonaro and I mean, not that it's a direct consequence, but you know, it's kind of echo, like a re reverberation of a certain kind of unrest that started that. But what it did is that it put into the spotlight something that, you know, marginalized populations in Brazil knew all along, that the Brazilian police and pretty much all police is violent and racist. But I, I wanted to write my thesis about the invisible violence or the parts of this violence that are not necessarily perceived immediately. So I wrote about the connections between sound and violence. Uh, the ways that the Brazilian police uses sound or forbids sound or manipulates sound in order to justify and continue to exercise something that, that has been happening in Brazil since, well, since the colonization and still produce. But I did that from Germany, right? Like, so I was sitting in my apartment in Berlin writing a thesis about political unrest. I, I was seeing friends of mine getting beaten on the streets uh, some friends getting arrested. And, you know, this kind of disconnection bothered me a lot. And also because when I presented this work, you know, parts of it, or after I defended my thesis and talked about things that I've written, 
there was this general feeling in the air that, you know, talk, to talk about political violence and colonial violence in that, you know, thinking of the long relationship between the police and the colonial apparatus, um, it has this kind of feeling that it was all, only happening there, you know, on the other side of the pond. Brazil, all former colonized countries, etc. you know, that, that the persistence of colonialism was only happening there. And that bothered me a lot. On the one hand, because I was doing that like from, from abroad, from, you know, the comfort of my, my Berlin uh, life. But on the other hand, because, you know, these things are still happening here. And, you know, there is a reason why um, colonialism was a, a, a narrow like movement that kind of returns within the borders of Europe right now. So I started looking at, okay, so what are the echoes of colonialism through sound that are happening here in Germany? And then by the time that I was finishing my PhD in 2017, was quite fortunate to come across uh, this so-called, uh, wait, let me click. Yeah, there we go. Um, this so-called dialect recognition software Dialectal canon software, sometimes also called Sprachgeometrie, sometimes also called Stimmgeometrie. There's a whole language thing that also plays a part. And this started in 2017. Uh, in April 2017, the Bundesamt für und Flüchtlinge announced they wanted to start working with software uh, in, as part of the asylum granting process. And then in August, they started a pilot project in one of the Außenstellen in Bamberg, so nearby. And then by November, 2017, it became a German-wide project. Um, I'll explain a little bit the teeny tiny details, the nitty gritty of it in a second. But one thing that I didn't think of mentioning, but then Martin uh, actually asked me to mention is that one is, was not the only thing, but one of the triggers for Germany to start using software to automate the process of asylum seeker to kind of take a little bit of workload from caseworkers, from Sachbearbeiter, um, was the case of Franco A, which I don't know if you are familiar with. Is this um, German soldier that was stationed in Alsace. And then at the same time, he was living as a Syrian asylum seeker here in, in Bayern as well. Uh, so he, had, he led this double life in which he was granted asylum because he posed as a Syrian refugee, a Jewish Syrian refugee. Um, and then he got, he went through the system and he got granted asylum and he had a plot, like a kill list to, uh, and he wanted to perform a series of terrorist attacks against, against political figures in Germany. Uh, and of course, blame those attacks on his Syrian identity. And because he was found out very silly in, in, in Wien, in the airport, but you know, because they figured out that one of the reasons why he was granted asylum was because his uh, hearing, his Anhörung, um, was not done in Arabic, but was done in French. And then he had like a French to German translator and that his hearing was really weird that, that you know, he said complicated things, but he was granted asylum all the same. The bump started this investigation to see if they had made more mistakes. And of course, they found out that they didn't. But at the same time, they had this project already like in their pockets, and they, it was a good excuse to kind of push it a little bit further. So what it does is that when an asylum seeker comes into Germany without documents, so without a passport, or without any proof of identity, and we can talk about the idea of proving identity as part of the process as well, but when a person comes with that, um, there are, in, in law, there are a lot of ways that the uh, state tries to figure out someone's identity. And one of them is through language tests. And most countries in Europe and the UK do that using linguists. Germany also did that. Um, but now they use this software. So they invite this person to this room that never looks like this one in the picture. And they have the asylum seeker speak for two minutes to a software, usually describing an image. And then automatically they get, so the Zachbearbeiter gets a PDF uh, with the probabilities of certain languages being spoken by the applicant. This is part of the Schulungsunterlagen, so the way that the, the, the people from Banff had to learn how to deal with the software, it's this one page um, only, but it's, of course it's a much longer manual because Germany. Uh, and this is kind of one of the, this is an example of what you get 
the Sachbearbeiter, the lawyers, the attorneys from asylum seekers get as a result. This is actually from, no, this is not from a real person. This is a version that I did because I don't want to use the real person, but it looks exactly like this. Um, and so you see that it gives like a, a certain distribution of probabilities. And then it has all these kind of technical details on that. So how Rauschabstand, um, my favorite is gender score, um, but it uses all this, this kind of technical lingo uh, to kind of justify these things. And you see that the ones that I left two um, marked on purpose, this idea of unbekannte Sprachen and andere Sprachen or dialects. So there are languages that either the software does not recognize or it recognizes something else, which is also a little bit tricky. But anyway, I started doing work, like trying to figure out what the heck is the software? And, you know, because Germany is as far as I know, and I've been checking this information constantly because I keep repeating it. Uh, it's the only country that has replaced this with software. And of course, they don't say anything about it. They are very um, blurry about what it is. There are a lot of like um, Kleine Anfragen and all these kind of um, Informationsfreiheitsgesetz that like requests that were done. And they always disclose a little bit of information here and there about how it works, but they contradict themselves all the time. And you know, it's never, never very clear how it works. But a few, a few things can be um, inferred from this. And part of my work, part of my research, and I'm not the only one doing this, but I do this through a more theoretical and artistic uh, means, but part of my research is also trying to figure out how this software works and how does it arrive at these probabilities? What is taken into consideration? What, what methods is it using? Because if you go through the um, um, kind of state-of-the-art research on language recognition and accent recognition, and, you know, you see there are many methods that they use. And one of the things that the BAMF says in the document is that it's purely based on phonetics. So it's all about matching like a language model with the way that someone speaks and looking at the phonemes, et cetera, et cetera. And from that deriving those probabilities. Um, but the more that I research on it, the more I figure out that it's complete bollocks. It doesn't make sense. It's all based on acoustic feature extraction. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Anyway, so in a nutshell, this is how the software works. We're going to get into more stuff about it probably as I speak. And feel free also to ask at the end, to the best of my knowledge, I'll try to answer. Um, so, so far, the last data that exists about the software is that I think it's from 2019, if I'm not mistaken, that it was already used in almost 20,000 asylum cases. And the correlation between that and deportation, the bump does not disclose. They cannot say that there's like a direct correlation, but what they say, and this is important, is that this is meant only to guide the decision. It's not a decision mm -hmm. in itself. So even though they are automating this process, in the end, it is a Sachbearbeiter that will look at this and decide whether this is relevant or not. So there's still like a human being deciding whether or not this counts as evidence for granting someone asylum or in most cases, deportation. Um, it's still in the hands of, you know, people, Sachbearbeiter. Um, yeah, so when I started researching this software, a lot of things came into my mind. So I started with the assumption that it was about phonetics, that it was about the way languages are spoken, the way languages work as, um, not as, as they're working like here, me speaking, but rather how they work as knowledge, how they work as a system of codes that can be translated into phonemes, pronunciation, and so on. And one of the first works that I did about it, uh, big works, that is, is this uh, was a performance piece that later became a radio piece that's still available at, uh, at Deutschland von Kultur uh, called A Series of Gaps Rather Than a Presence. So in this piece, uh, I first presented it as a performance at the CTM Festival in 2019. And then a couple of months later, it became this um, Klangstück, if you want, um, at Deutschland von Kultur. And yeah, so this is a picture from the performance. So it was myself doing uh, electronics and a trio of what I call like a trio of migrant voices. 
So I had like Inanna al Azhar, um, Diko, and Mariana Bahia. So two Syrian singers and one Brazilian singer. Um, and I constructed this story connecting the Bundesamt für Migration und Flüchtlinge with, I don't know if you are aware of, with the Preußische Phonographische Commission, so the Prussian Phonographic Commission. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit what it is, but I connected these two institutions in time and space because many of the refugee centers, the welcoming centers of the BAMF, are on former um, prisoner of war camps, former military camps that were sites in which the Prussian Phonographic Commission in the beginning of the 20th century uh, recorded prisoners of war in order to catalog and make sense of their access. So there is a hundred year long history of Germany's interest in making sense of dialects and accents for different purposes. But one thing connects them both is this idea of tying voice to the body, body to origin and origin to citizenship. And this train of thought is important because it informs my work a lot. And I think it informs the decisions of the bump, but it also informs how we understand ourselves as human and how do we listen to ourselves as human. I'm gonna get into that. Um, the, Phonographische Commission, they recorded prisoners of war. Uh, they had a team of linguists and they had a phonograph, a recent invention by them. So we're talking about 1914 to 1918, 1919 maybe. Um, and they traveled across prisoner of war camps in what is today Germany, uh, because the chief linguist, uh, a, a guy called Wilhelm Dögen, he wanted to create the largest library of languages and accents in the world. And so these recordings are available today in the Humboldt University in Berlin and the Lautarchiv. And many of these soldiers that were recorded were colonial soldiers. And what I mean with that is that there were soldiers from former colonies, by then still colonies, but from colonies fighting their colonizers' wars. So you had soldiers from India, from Nepal, from Martinique, from, um, from the Caribbean islands that are still protectorates of uh, like colonies, basically of France, and these soldiers were also recorded, but not speaking, not always speaking their native tongues. They were also speaking colonial languages. So there is this connection that happens that spans this interest in like tying, again, as I said, tying voice to citizenship. And this performance created kind of went into connecting these things in time and space using poetic language, a lot of uh, voice work improvisation, and um, there was some hip hop involved as well, some uh, archival recordings. And I also used uh, text to speech software to read with the most neutral German accent possible. Lots of scare quotes here. The um, uh, Dienstanweisungen, I don't know how to translate that, but like this, the, the notifications, the kind of like documentation about the software, about the dialect recognition software that, that the BAMF uh, circulated internally, but also as part of uh, press releases. So I used all these materials to create this piece, this piece you can listen, but I brought uh, a couple of, uh, an excerpt, like a five minute excerpt. You can listen to all of it if, if you feel like. Um, this part that I'm gonna show is the three singers talking about what is known to us and what is not known to us in terms of how much information do we have about these two places in time and space and how they come together. What was important for me in this piece, and I think it's worth mentioning before I show, is that um, language plays a big part because none of the speakers, I have also my voice in that piece, none of the speakers in, in, in this are native German speakers, but we are all speaking in German with our accents and our mispronunciations and you know all those things. Plus there's also like, parts in Portuguese, parts in Arabic, and parts in Kurdish as well, which were not translated. So I wanted to keep this, you know, opacity in languages as part of the piece itself. Um, yeah, so this is the, if you wanna find it, Zingam Klangkunst at Deutschland für Kultur. This photo is one of the former prisoner camps in Chemnitz, uh, which is, you know, 500 meters away from a uh, refugee center from the bump. It's not on the same spot, but on the same street, which is all wrong. 
not the wrong, but I, I changed which part I wanted to show. I talk about something, I did something else. I could have saved all the explanation about the software. Anyways, um, but there is a part, in, uh, because it's a longer part, I think it's six minutes long, and that's why I changed uh, last minute. But you can, you can check, it's the part that comes right before this, what you just heard, that the three singers, the three singers are like talking about what is known and what is not. And they talk about the number of times that the, the same story was told. Um, but anyway, this was basically a, a juxtaposition between one of the recordings of the Fonografische Commission, com commission with the um, Um Yeah. So much for changing, uh, changing of opinion last minute. Um, but what I think was, I was interested in this piece. Um, again, I was still thinking, I was still working under the assumption that the software worked with phonetics. And because of that, this becomes interesting. Because this is the kind of the assessment files that the, the Persian Phonographic Commission would produce from these recordings. And, you know, they predate also a lot of Nazi documentation, which looks kind of similar if you ever came across one of those. But it also, you know, this idea of like listing and, you know, kind of um, dissecting things about someone's way of being. Um, this part is basically like personal details. Um, but this, especially the, the bottom part, is really interesting because all of these documents, they had at the end the assessment of the, the person that recorded, and they would give an opinion about the voice that was recorded. So in this case, so it was a clear, um, strong voice with a good uh, accent on consonant, a good, a good uh, pronunciation of consonants. And this was done by William Gilliam himself. So, I mean, these this assessments were of course based on scientific, uh, the scientific knowledge of the time, but in a way they are also very subject. They are all based on the way that Wilhelm Gilliam himself was listening to those recordings. And in the same way that when you produce like a, a, a file with probabilities of speech in this dialect recognition software, you're also producing a subjective assessment, but based on software, based on you know, mathematical assessment. And what connects these two things is that is this desire for listening as something that extracts something. So extractive listening, listening as something that is able to produce a certain degree of truth. So a listening that this truth that is produced in both cases, in this case of the commission, but with the case of the bump, this truth is basically law, so a juridical truth turned into symbolic truth. So you have like a set of laws that determine citizenship that are through listening transformed into symbolic truth. This person comes from that country or in the case of dialects and accents, even closer, this person comes from that ethnicity. And, you know, this for me is, one of the many problematic ones is this, this production of a temporary truth, again, sedimenting this connection between voice, body, body, origin, origin, citizenship. Um, but the more that I research, I mentioned this already, the more that I research this um, software, the less I figure out it has to do with phonetics, especially because details on that file tell me otherwise especially because it's based on probabilities, especially because it's based on a language model, and especially because the BAMF never says explicitly whether or not they're using machine learning to use to, in the software, which will be another discussion even by itself. But because they use machine learning, and I'm pretty sure they do, um, what it says is that it's not based on phonetics at all. And also because if you were based on phonetics, you had to have a transcription of what the person says, and this does not exist. Um, it's instead it's based on acoustic feature extraction and if you're not familiar with that is I wasn't either but um, it's basically not measuring phonemes not measuring pronunciation but measuring um, certain characteristics of the sound recording that can be mathematically analyzed and matched to an existing model and one of the methods that they use is called male frequency substrate coefficients. This is basically technical knowledge, but what is important about this method is that it tries to reproduce, i ready for this, it's, it tries to reproduce the shape of someone's vocal tract. So basically this method assumes that people from the same 
language group, same origin, same ethnicity, if you want, who have vocal tracts in a similar shape. If that doesn't sound like phrenology to you, I don't know what it is. You know, this is racial sciences 2.0. Mm -hmm. So I've been really interested in this acoustic feature extraction, not because acoustic feature extraction is racist in itself, that's not what I'm saying, but rather the uses of it and the way that it's put to use is still pretty much 19th century science, but make it machine learning. So I changed the way that I approach my work to kind of figure out the methods. So how does the software arise at answers to what an accent is, what a language is, what even a shape of a vocal tract is, what are harmonics, what are, you know, all these details that is extracting from this two minutes recording that if you look, um, in the, in the document is not even two minutes, sometimes 20 seconds, sometimes 30 seconds. Um, it's extracting a lot of information that is put to use in a certain way. So I wanted to figure out how does the software arrive at these questions, at this answer, sorry. Um, and this all happens not in time. So it doesn't analyze the recording as it happens in time. It analyzes in the frequency domain, also called the spectral domain. What do I mean with that? It means that it analyzes how frequencies change over a period of time. And usually this period of time is micro, it's like 25 milliseconds. So it, it measures the peaks in certain frequencies. And because it measures these peaks, it, it's able to tell things about someone's origin. It's a long stretch and it has a long history of that stretch. And you know, I'm not making that up and it seems absurd because it, it is a little bit, but at the same time, it is fascinating because it is really something that is being used as an instrument for deportation. But what is in that? So how does it learn to translate that number into an accent? How does it learn what an accent is? These are the bigger questions that I'm interested in. Um, and because it's called the spectral domain is also particularly interesting because in philosophy, there is a persistence of the specter as a figure of thinking. So you can, you can think about Derrida writing in, in the 90s about the spectrum of Marx. You can think about Mark Fisher talking about ontology, also borrowing from Derrida. But you can also think about Sayat Valencia, the Mexican philosopher that wrote about Gore capitalism, talking about how media spectralizes the body. So the idea that the body is made undone by these devices. So there is like a, the, the, you become a specter of a body and there is a derealization that is at the same time full of possibility, but at the same time, not a body anymore. And this dichotomy interests me a lot, also because it matches with the whole analysis being done in the spectral domain. Um, so I'm interested in, in seeing what is about the spectrum that is so fascinating to all of these questions of philosophy, of asylum, because it's always talked about like the migrant, the refugee, the asylum seeker as a ghost, right? Like as the specter, as the invisible population of any country and so on. So this, like, these are like all discourses that are based in, that, that are present in media, but also in academia as well, and also in the arts and so on. And, you know, more importantly, that through the spectrum, through the spectrum it's being produced a method of identification that stands as a placeholder for identity. So identification becomes the means by which we arrive at identity. And this is not the same. Identification is not the same as identity. So I'm interested in all these questions. And machine learning as it does, and machine listening, because it's never listening, it's basically mathematics. What it does is that it kind of reinforces this notion that ident identity can be produced through identification. And through that, it also reproduces what it means to be someone to be fully human. Right, like so a fully human is someone that has papers to identify or that can be placed in a certain origin with a certain identity with a certain or, um, ethnic, uh, ethnic group and so on. But the spectral domain is basically something being measured or something being transformed. That does not mean that it is immediately that language or that accent, but before it learns how, it arrive, how to arrive at that answer it is something else. It, it just arrives at that because it is told how to do that. That's where I place my work. This was a long stretch just to say where I place my work right now. And why I'm interested in this is because 
Again, I'm interested in how these methods is still refine ways of being human. And because it refines a certain way of being human, it also defines who's not entitled to that status of humanity. And it ends up over-representing, and this is uh, Caribbean philosopher Sylvia Winter's words, this over-representation of the human that is done through identification. So through being identified, the human is over-represented. It's never the thing in itself. It's an over-representation of it. And with my recent work, which I'm going to show right now, and I'm finally going to get to the point, um, I've been interested in disengaging those things. So the spectrum on the one hand, before that moment of learning, before that moment of identification, the moment in which everything is made undone, but not necessarily redone. And hence why I've been calling this spectral undo. So what, what can be done, what, what, what things can be undone through focusing on the spectrum? And this is an open question. Okay. Uh, my God, I'm speaking for so long. Okay. Um, I want to show this work called There is a Point at Which Methods Devour Themselves, which is a Franz Fanon quote. Um, this was one of the first incursions that I did into probing a little bit in this idea of the spectral, because as I was saying, there is this concern with extractive listening, right? Like, so ext extractive listening is something that I want to reinforce here as because it is the method, not only in this parts of language, uh, asylum um, dialect recognition or the Prussian uh, phonographic commission, but also the ways, in many ways in which sound studies work, in which academia works. It's always in anthropology, ethnography, etc. It's always listening as this extractive device. Um, and what instead, what needs to be more discussed is that this is all produced by the listening. So listening produces this truths and not sounds in themselves. And because we focus not on who's producing, but rather in who is listening, we can switch around the logics of how this extractive listening operates, or we can expose how this extractive listening operates. So with this work, I wanted to you know, give a little, little nudge towards that. Uh, so this was an eight channel installation that unfortunately never saw the light of day because it was right after the lockdown in 2020, uh, before, sorry, the second lockdown 2020. Some people saw it, fortunately, but um, in, with this work, it was uh, installed in Frankfurt. Uh, and this is an eight channel piece that is basically a Brazilian song, um, which tells the story, the biblical story of the prodigal son. I don't know if you're familiar with it, the Deferlorene Zone. If we come back here, you're gonna see that the Deferlorene Zone is one of the stories that prisoners of war were asked to tell in the recordings of the Prussian Phonographic Commission. And the prodigal son, if you're not familiar with the story, is the story of the son who leaves, leaves home, goes into like a feats of partying and drinking, loses everything, comes back and is forgiven by the father. And he has a jealous brother as well. But you know, that's not the point. The point is that it's a story about coming home and finding acceptance back at home. The images that asylum seekers are asked to describe in the dialect test, the bump never discloses what they are, but there are like gossip about it that it is also a family sitting at home and eating a meal. So it's again uh, an image of home. So the, the idea of returning home persists in recordings of language and dialect. So I took a Brazilian song that talks about the story of the prodigal son. And I asked uh, a Greek singer, her name is Emilia Varanaki. I asked her to learn the song without having the lyrics. So she learned by ear the words, the pronunciation of words. And we recorded uh, her in studio. And it's, the piece is basically her singing the song. So let's wait, wait, wait. So what I wanted to do with this piece is to bring the question of what is a voice and what is a human voice to the listener. What you listen now, it's, this is a, it, it sounds a little bit weird because it's a binaural recording from the room itself. And I'll tell you why in a second, but what you just listened was not Emilia singing. What you listened was a synthesizer trying its best to sound like Emilia. So I deconstructed her voice frequency, like in several frequency bands and reproduce that using a synthesizer. 
So a synthesizer basically decomposed her voice and recomposed using oscillators, et cetera, et cetera. But, and then because it's an eight channel installation you have like different frequency bands kind of traveling around the eight channels. So there are moments, I think you notice that like certain frequencies become a little bit glitchy, some become bassy. And this is also because I measured the resonant frequencies of the room and tuned the frequencies from her voice that I extracted, and I use that word deliberately, um, to match the frequencies of the room itself. So I wanted the room to really engulf the listening experience, to really blur the edges of, are, are we listening to a human voice or not? And in the end, the answer doesn't matter, but it's really to bring that trouble into the moment of listening and to ask how much can we believe a voice is human if we say it's human or if we say it's not, but how much of that is imparted on our experiences of listening? Also, I don't know if anyone here speaks Brazilian Portuguese, but her pronunciation sometimes is really on point, sometimes it's completely off. So that also adds another layer because, you know, if you don't speak Portuguese, you don't get those nuances as well. But most importantly, what I wanted to do is to really um, bring the question of how much humanity can we impart in a voice, not to the work. The work doesn't set itself to answer that question, but to the listener. That's why the title of the work is, there is a point at which methods devour themselves because I use all these methods, extracting, measuring the room, blah, 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 for the piece to be, for the listening, the mo listening moment to be devoured by you standing in the middle of the, of the speakers. And that's why the recording is also that. I could not just play like the way I exported the file because it doesn't give all these feedbacks that you were listening, like this bass resonances. These are all part of the room resonating. Um, so with this piece, I was interested in really like asking this question, you know, how much of who is list, who is this, this, this voice from relies on the listener. And I think, you know, if I may say so myself, I think this piece does a good job of showing that in a way. Um, this was another part of the installation, I'm not gonna get into this, um, but, we just had like a sub bass frequencies in another room. You're not, you didn't listen to the sub bass frequencies, but then the room was kind of shaking as well. Um, anyway, um, these are Emilia's notes. I don't know if anyone here speaks Greek, but she translated like what she was listening to her own Greek uh, brain. And I think it's, it's just a curiosity because I think it's also a very interesting process of listening and trying to make sense of what you're listening to. <laughs> Um, yeah, and her pronunciation is really like sometimes super important. And the last work, and then I'm going to stop and then we can talk, have a beer, whatever, is uh, a work that I just did in November last year called Gismonti, Zona do Nocer. Uh, Gismonti means unmounting, undoing. And Zona do Nocer, it's also again a Fanon uh, nod. Fanon talks about the colonial subject being caught in this zone of known being. And I took like kind of what I learned from the piece that I did uh, with Amelia, the one that I just showed, I took to another extreme. I wanted to figure out if there is a way for a voice to refuse to announce a body. So can we really disengage this connection between voice and body? And you know, by listening to a voice, can we not think about the body that is producing that voice? And can we really go again deep into the spectral components of a voice analysis to figure out something else from it. Because what I think is that in the spectral domain, the voice cannot be other than itself. And if you try to measure that, you're not measuring the voice, you're measuring the conditions of mediation. So I wanted to reverse that logic and not measure the conditions of mediation, but rather use the texture of the voice, the spectral, haptics, the capacity of the voice to be something else. And I took that to an extreme. So what I did in this piece, uh, I presented in two ways. So there is one that is online. I can send the link later and you can listen. It's a 40 minute piece. And I also did it as a live performance. And for that, I invited uh, a singer from Brazil this time, a death metal singer. Uh, her name is Fernanda Lira. And she's an amazing uh, death metal singer. If you're into death metal, you should check her band out. Uh, it's called Krita. Um, and I basically 
did the whole piece having everything in it done by her voice. Uh, so what I mean with that, so this is a nice picture of me performing the piece. Um, so <laughs> I had this poem that I wrote uh, for her to, and she did this with, with the deaf metal voice, but she also did like a lot of screaming, a lot of um, vowels, articulations and so on. But basically I had, so if you look back here, I use a modular synthesizer. I'm not gonna nerd out on this, but I'm just, um, I had her voice triggering everything in the piece. And I had her voice basically deciding also what should be played when and with which pitches, etc. So I was not trying to perform analysis on her voice. I was trying to use her voice as the sole component for everything that you listen. And with that, I think, you know, I created like a, a piece that is highly musical in a way, but at the same time, again, trying to really go deep into the texture of her voice, especially because her voice is so unusual. I mean, if you listen to death metal, of course, it's not unusual, but you know, because she's using her body to produce her voice in a different way than if she's just speaking, I was really interested into the ways in which the body can, you know, refuse to announce itself. And that's the, 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 the key part of this for me. It's like, can I find ways to, to um, think of the voice without thinking of the body? And when I say the body, I'm not, I'm not trying to see the voice as just, you know, this ontological thing without, without the materiality. No, that's not it. I'm focusing exactly on the materiality of the voice and thinking of the body without thinking of gender, race, ethnicity, and so on before those things, beyond those things, you know? Because only that we can try, we can try to dismantle and to, to disengage, to de deconstruct, undo all these racial uh, profilings, all these you know, gender assumptions that happen. Can we think about the body as the body, as flesh? So, and I think death metal lends itself. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not joking. Of course, I'm super interested in death metal as a listener, but I think like death metal singers probe on those limits, and that, that's why I wanted to work with her. And I like the results. I think this is going to be the longest, and I'm not going to say anything about that because I spoke a lot already. It's five minutes long, and then when it's done, it's done. Thanks for listening, and we can we can talk about whatever you want later.